Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. On Tuesday, President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela died, as most of our viewers know now. Now joining us to discuss the significance of his life and the meaning of his death is Greg Pallas. Greg's an investigative journalist. He's worked for the BBC. He's written for The Nation magazine, Rolling Stone. He's the author of the new bestseller, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits. Thanks for joining us again, Greg. Glad to be with you, Paul. Well, first of all, let's talk about your connection with Chavez. You made at least one or two films about Chavez. You got, you got to know him personally. What, what were your impressions? Well, was, I was assigned by BBC television to find out who this guy was and why the U.S. wanted to kill him. Uh, the, the, Pat Robertson uh, made the statement on the air. Hugo Chavez thinks, uh, you know, we're trying to kill him and we ought to just go and do it. And for the simple reason that um, a Reverend Robertson made, which is that Hugo Chavez is sitting on the world's largest pool of oil. It's bigger now. The Venezuelan reserves are actually bigger than those of Saudi Arabia. No one's close. And therefore, uh, the, you know, the U.S. oil companies, the British oil companies, French oil companies, want to know why Venezuelans are sitting on top of their oil and won't give it away to them. But, the, but the Chavez does sell oil to the United States. Venezuela is one of the main suppliers of oil to the United States. And while there was a lot of rhetoric against the United States from, from President Chavez, they never did stop selling oil to them. No, Chavez never wanted to stop selling oil to the U.S. His, uh, um, his nation would die if it didn't sell oil. The idea that Chavez would ever threaten to remove oil is ridiculous. But what the, the U.S. oil companies and the, and the big oil companies around the world didn't like is that Chavez wouldn't give the stuff away. Chavez sells Venezuelan crude oil. As of last week, it was about $101 a barrel. That's $33 a barrel more than uh, the Canadians sell their heavy oil for, the same type of oil that Chavez sells, which is, by the way, as I mentioned on your program before, the reason we haven't, uh, that the Koch brothers in the U.S. is pushing for this so-called XL Keystone pipeline, uh, it's all about trying to get oil at a cheaper price than Chavez will sell it. And Chavez wouldn't sell it cheaply because he uses that money extraordinarily, unusually, as uh, uh, for the Venezuelan people. It's just unheard of that a big oil nation uses their money from oil to give to the people. Right. Now, do- well, in terms of what you've seen so far, American media's reaction to uh, the death of President Chavez, actually, I, I, in one of the other interviews, I'm going to show this again. Here, here's the New York Times just hours after President Chavez's death. And the headline is, uh, Chavez dies, uh, leaving a bitterly divided Venezuela. And my, my comment was, uh, we, we can put that down now. My comment was, and, and tell me exactly which country isn't bitterly divided. The United States is this great harmonious paradise. And especially an oil country, yeah, you're going to have a division over who gets to use the oil wealth. Actually, I, I completely disagree. It's not a bitterly divided nation. Chavez was overwhelmingly reelected several times. I've been all over the United States covering elections here and all over Venezuela and all over many nations covering elections. Venezuela is actually one of the few, uh, one of the least divided nations on the planet. The, uh, the, the Chavez administration was unbelievably popular. Yeah, but uh, listen. Even the, even but, the Carter uh, Center. Yeah. The Carter Center is funded by um, uh, this guy Cisneros, who is a Venezuelan opponent. Of Chavez, even the Carter Center says that no one's ever accused Chavez of stealing an election. Uh, he's very, very, very popular there. He was popular. His party's popular for a simple reason. As one of um, his opponents told me, a broadcaster, she said, "Well, you know, Chavez gives bread and bricks to the people. You know, because they used to live in shanties. They now live in real houses. They were starving. Now they have food. They had no medicine. Now they have." You know, Chavez care is beats Obamacare by a mile. Um, so, of course, and he says, so, of course, they vote for him. And she said that with disgust, like, you know, how dare he give the oil money to the poor people? But that's what he did. So it's not a divided nation that, yeah, I mean, you could say it's divided 
75-25. But well, I, 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 well, we could argue about this because I think it may be more like the way the vote breaks down, which is maybe 55-60 was the supporting Chavez, and you could have 30 to 40 percent that were opposed, which here, I mean, the United States, you're, who knows? I mean, a lot of people don't vote, and it's maybe 50-50. But I, I think you're right. I mean, clearly he won election after election and he had majority support. That, but that doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of bitter opposition to him. And not only from just the rich. There were, you know, if you in, I've been in Caracas a f quite a few times. And, you know, there, there was opposition even at the levels in the working class, in the middle class. But I take your point. The majority of people clearly supported Chavez and what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there are always those who felt that the revolution that he, as he called it, didn't go far enough. So there's always a big opposition from the left and young people were chafing. They want a new world. Uh, they hadn't had the deprivations of their parents. But, uh, you know, he was a popular guy. So but to take, talk, that, a little, talk a little bit about the American media reaction to his death. Uh, the, the, the level of venom is really something. It's unbelievable. Both, and, and what's amazing to me is it doesn't matter whether it's, a, you know, the kind of Fox News stuff where you assume that the right wing will attack Chavez and you'll assume Pat Robertson will attack Chavez but you get this from the New York Times you get this from the from PBS and well we know why PBS number one um, funder of the uh, of PBS is Chevron Corporation I mean they're the petroleum broadcast system and they they carry the oil company line and the oil companies have always been just screaming angry about Hugo Chavez. And why? It's because of his uh, hydrocarbon law. In 2001, he passed a law through the legislature that said that Venezuelans will uh, no longer take 16% um, of the value of their oil and selling it abroad, but 30%. That's because they, they cut the first contracts and set the first royalties when oil was $10 a barrel. Now it's $100 a barrel. So they said, you know, some of that profit has to go to the people. Um, heavy oil in Venezuela was sold to foreign companies like Exxon at a 1% royalty. They, the Venezuelans got a penny out of the dollar of their own oil. He said, well, that changes to 16%. Now, there's another leader who did that named Sarah Palin in Alaska, who also raised royalties on the same U.S. oil companies by about the same amount. But no one said that. Uh, Palin was a dictator, but in the case of Chavez, they say he's a dictator so that they can try to overthrow him. Yeah, you can't. You can't read it. You couldn't over the last few re years read a newspaper story, hardly a story, where the word dictator didn't get into the first paragraph when describing yeah. Chavez. That, in spite of the fact he would win election after election. Yes, but, in but, fact. But let me ask you something fact, else. Let me give you. An, oh, this is, I think an important example. You had a guy named Romero of the New York Times has an interview with Chavez, and he asks him, when are you going to give up power? Now, has he ever gone to Obama or to Bush and say, and, and you know, Bush wasn't even elected, I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, did he ever go to Bush, any New York Times reporter, and say, when are you going to give up power when you have, and when you have an elected president in the middle of a term? And they kept calling him a strong man, an authoritarian, dictator-like, whatever that means, it's like Italian-like or something. Um, and, you know, this is all about, in other words, he didn't go along with, um, with what the oil companies wanted. And they would say things like bitterly divided nation, oh, destroyed the Venezuelan economy. The Venezuelan economy is increasing at about 5% this year, as it has been steadily for a few years. If I'll take that type of wreckage for the United States growing at 5% a year, and, you know, uh, he's done a tremendous job for the Venezuelan people. Now, look, I had my problems with Chavez. Chavez called me his friend. I said, no, I'm not your friend because I'm not the friend of any politician. I don't care who they are. I don't want to be charmed. I don't want, you know, they always disappoint me. They always break my heart. I'm here to report the story. And I told some stories that he and his uh, crowd didn't like. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to join the New York Times crowd and talk about him as a dictator or a guy who won't give up power. They keep talking about him holding power. He's elected. And, uh, and I got to tell you that during the, there was a coup d'etat. Chavez was kidnapped. The New York Times reported that he had resigned from office. It was a lie. I was working for BBC Television and The Guardian. I stayed up all night to finally get a hold of Chavez's uh, people uh, who had heard from Chavez that he was kidnapped. He hadn't resigned. The New York Times, when I asked them, why did you run this story that he'd resigned? They said, well, 
because the State Department told us. And that's how the New York Times yeah, gets it. I, I, I remember that moment. You were one of the only one or two journalists that actually tracked that story down. Everyone else yes. either took it from the State Department or they took it from the Venezuelan media who were actually in on organizing the coup. That's right. The Venezuelan media were in on it. In fact, uh, one thing I disagreed with Chavez is that he closed down one of the stations. But it was a few years after that coup attempt. But if, if any United States network, yours or, or Fox or anyone else, called for the violent overthrow of the Obama administration, said, kidnap the president, kill him, take over. I think, I think he'd be shut down. It's, uh, no, you, violent overthrow of the government is uh, punishable by death in our constitution. All right, thank, and, uh, yeah. thanks very much for joining us, Greg. You're very welcome. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.